spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, for this new year. And we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in 2020. And we can count, O oh God, and sure that you will continue to be faithful in 2021 and onwards, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will cleanse us of all our sins and forgive us, Lord, that we may be worthy to listen to your words today. I pray, Lord, that you will help me to be a blessing to your people, give me wisdom, and help me, Lord, to preach thy word according to how you want it preached, O God. And I pray that your people will open up their hearts and mind to receive your word and give us the grace that all of us will be able to apply them, O God. Lord, if there is one or two or even more here today who is not yet sure of heaven, not yet saved, I pray, O God, Holy Spirit, for you to do your work of convicting, O God, so that, Lord, today there will be one, two, or more whose name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I pray, O God, that in everything that we will do, as we have done so far, that you will be glorified and that you alone will be lifted up in our midst. Help us, Lord, as we continue to serve you. May we be worthy, O God. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May be seated. Thank you very much. So this morning, we're going to talk about uh, the changes that happened in our lives and the changes that are still yet to happen and the importance of uh, attitude that we may be able to glorify God in our lives. In our text in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, we can see that the Apostle Paul is beseeching the uh, us or the children of God because of God's mercy that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice. So our life should be characterized by serving the Lord. It should be serving Him with sacrifice. Because it is simply not possible to serve without sacrifice as we are living in this world. And this world is trying its best to pull us down and to make our lives miserable that we will lose our testimony and not be effective in the ministry of the Lord. Something that is holy, acceptable unto God, which according to the Bible is our reasonable service. Meaning to say there is no other service but serving God with sacrifice, with holiness, and something that is acceptable or agreeable in the sight of the Lord. And then he says, and be not conformed to this world. So that is the uh, uh, command given to us, not to conform to this world, because this world is simply against God. It, it, uh, as we have read a while ago in our Sunday school, that uh, all that is present in this world is the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the Word. So that's why... We are being commanded or asked to be not conformed to this word, but to be transformed, how? By the renewing of our mind. So there must be changes. Uh, our mind must be renewed. And it must be transformed and it must conform to the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ as we are admonished to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because without at the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is simply impossible to please Him. It is simply impossible to understand Him. It is, it is simply impossible that we will be able to live our lives because all we can do is do our best, but to live the Christian life is to allow the Holy Spirit to live or to lead us or to live through us. Because in the flesh, it is impossible to live the Christian life. No such Christian will be able to live the Christian life without the help of the Holy Spirit. It's actually the Holy Spirit who will live the Christian life through us. And then it says that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the will of God is paramount in our lives. It is not my will, your will, 
nor anybody's will that should be our priority or that should be paramount in our lives, but it should be the will of God. Because without doing God's will, then there is no way to please God. There is no way that we'll be able to uh, satisfy the Lord. There is no way that we can honor, glorify, and lift up the name of God. So uh, the will of God should happen in our lives or we must find ourselves in the will of God. And uh, let me say this, that there is no failure in the will of God. But there is no success outside the will of God. That's why if you're not saved today, then you must find yourself in the will of God. And it is God's will that not any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. To the saving uh, knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may become the children of God. You see, when we try to do our best, our best will never be enough. But if we are going to do it God's way, then God's way is always enough. And it is always sufficient. So that is why it is very important that we do things God's way, not our way. You see, many people are living an insane kind of life. They do not want to make changes in life, but they want things, things to, be, to change in their lives. You see, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That is simply insanity. When you do the same thing over and over again, you will have the same result. And the reason why this definition or saying has become acceptable or uh, have become uh, uh, something that is widely used is because there is so much truth in it. How can we expect things to change if nothing about us changes? If you want things to change, then change must also happen to us. So we are what we are and we do what we do by choice. Life is a matter of choice. We make choices every day. When we do right, uh, wrong choices, then our lives will become miserable. But when we make the right choice, then our life will become better. So if we want things to be different in our lives, then we have to decide to change. It is up to us to make things different. Question, are you satisfied in your Christian life? If not, then make a change. Decide to make a change. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that God has no part in this. But simply that we have to decide to change before we will ever change. And when we decide to change, then we depend on God to bring those changes in our lives. Amen? That is why it says here that, that we must not be conformed to this word. It is a, a choice. It is a decision that we have to make. And once we do that, then we depend on the power of God so that our lives will be conformable to the will of God instead of conformable into this word. So in Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, God, or the Apostle Paul, is telling us that we need to change the way we think. We need to banish the worldly thinking that has infected us. And when we remove our uh, worldly thinking, then we need to start to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our thought lives. And once we allow that, then we are going to know the perfect will of God in our lives. If we are thinking worldly, or if we are thinking about this word, then there is simply no way that we can know the will of God. Because they are completely opposite to each other. So once we remove worldly thinking, and we start to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts, then the Holy Spirit will guide us in knowing that, that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is no worldly Christian that we live in the will of God. When we are worldly Christians, then we are living in, uh, 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 in our own will. So Paul is telling us that we need to change our attitude when it comes to our Christian life. We should have an attitude of going along 
with God's will instead of our own will. Someone has said that the greatest discovery of the century is not if you can change your attitude, then you can change your life. If you can change your attitude, then you can change your life. That is actually the basis of being a Christian. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen? You cannot say, oh, I am now saved, but I am the same. No. The Bible is very clear. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You cannot live the same way because you are now a new creature. You have been given a new nature who will live in the will of God and not in the same way of life before you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are saved, then there has been great change in your life once you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What are these changes? Number one, this, there is what we call the positional change. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ positionally, there is a change. We have gone from condemnation to forgiveness. Instead of being condemned, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now you are forgiven. And this is what we call justification. That is the positional change. And then there is what we call the progressive change. We are moving from the works of the flesh to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that is what we call sanctification. And then there is what we call the permanent change. From damnation to glorification. And one day, when we get to heaven, we are going to have a glorified body. Amen. So, these changes happen once a person repented of his sins and put his faith on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why you will definitely know if you are saved. You will see the evidences in your life if you are really saved. You will see it in your action. You will see it in your thinking. You will see it in your disposition. You will see it in your desire. There will be changes when we got saved. You see, the positional change occurs immediately or instantaneously once we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Before we are condemned. You see, people without Christ, when they die, they will go to hell. That's it. Because they're under condemnation. They're already condemned by God. So when they die, like the rich man in Luke chapter 16, when he opened his eyes, he is in torment. And he will stay there forever. There is no second chance after we die. But when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, then positionally, you are now forgiven. When you die, when you open your eyes, you will be in heaven. And you will be with the Lord forever and forever. That is the positional change that happened in our lives. That is what we call justification. Remember, all of us are guilty before God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God according to Romans 3 23 and then we are all personally responsible for our sins and therefore because we sin we are under condemnation as Romans 6 23 says that for the wages of sin is death not simply physical death but second death that we will be away from God forever in the fiery torment of hell so when we, just like when we break the law of society, we will be brought before a court and then we are going to be judged. So all people will be judged by God. And because of our sins, we are all condemned before God. So pastor, there is no hope, there is hope. There is remedy and God applied the remedy by sending his son to die on the cross of Calvary so that he will pay for our sins. And what he has done will be imputed unto us. 
You see, our salvation does not depend on our works, but on the works or the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in Jesus, then that finished work, that righteousness, was imputed, accredited unto us, so that we are forgiven, and when God look at us, we are righteous before Him. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse number 22. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. So whoever you are if you will believe then God will impute the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ to you. So the righteousness of God is applied to and laid upon all those who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the technical term for that is justification. In the New Testament, it was used over and over again, but the Apostle Paul mainly used this term in a judicial sense, wherein the judge will declare a sinner as righteous. Wherein God will say that it is now okay between you and me. So how did this happen? What is the basis for our justification? You see, the Lord Jesus Christ did something. God did something so that we can be justified. Because all of us are condemned. We have no ability to save ourselves. Because by virtue of our sin, all of us will go to hell. But God so loved us. But God do not want that any should perish. God does not want anybody to go to hell. Why? We are created in the image and likeness of God. God loved us. He wants us to be, to come to Him. To come back to Him. But you see, the devil is doing everything so that we will be deceived by the devil to go to hell. But God has done something and it is your fault if you will die and go to hell. It is never God's fault because God did everything so that people might be saved. Amen. He has only one son, a very precious son. And he sent his son to die an agonizing death at the cross of Calvary to, to put in, in his place in himself all the sins of the world that we might be justified. And what is the basis of this justification? The grace of God. Amen? Because of God's grace, unmerited favor, because we cannot merit salvation. Therefore, God has given us salvation freely. Let us look at Romans chapter 5, beginning from verse number 6, down to 21. For when we were yet without strength, you see, without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. We were yet sinners. We are enemies of God. Christ died for us. You see, you may die for a righteous man. You may die for a good man. But the Lord Jesus Christ died for sinners like you and me. Much more being then being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse number 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen? Amen. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned you see all of us death is upon us the judgment is upon us for all have sinned for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Amen? Free gift. For if 
through the offense of one man is dead much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many that's why listen salvation is a gift you see so many people are deceived by religions that you need to do so much to be saved yung bang gawin mo lahat ito, sundin mo itong utos, magpakabait ka, magrosaryo ka, mag, magpatira pa ka, magsakripisyo ka, lahat-lahat. Hindi ho. The Lord Jesus Christ did that for us. He carried our cross. He wore our crown. He took our stripe upon Himself. That is what He did. He did it for us. But not as the offense, so also as the free gift. So salvation is free. It is a gift. All you have to do is to accept the gift. And yet so many people, because of their religion, will not accept that gift because they want to work for the gift. You do not work for the gift. You work for salary. You work for wages. But gift is free. And all you have to do is receive it. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many and not as it was by one that sinned so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification for if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ, so contrasting what Adam did and what the Lord Jesus Christ did. 19. Uh, therefore, as by one offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What is the basis of our justification? It is the grace of God. What brought about that grace? The obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, in verse number 9, we can see that one basis of our justification is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Jesus' blood, and that made all who choose to believe in Him right with God. Why? Because that death is the propitiation for our sin. It, may, it means is satisfied the, uh, uh, what God wants to happen for our sins. And not only that, because of that, the Lord Jesus Christ lived a righteous life. He died a righteous death. And therefore, He has His righteousness, not of the law, and that righteousness was imputed given, accredited unto us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who? The Lord Jesus Christ became sin for us. Who knew no sin? He did not commit any sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is simply vicarious he lived a life that is acceptable to God and I cannot live a life and you cannot live a life that is acceptable to God so he lived that life and then he imputed that righteousness of that life to us so that when God look at us God will see the righteousness of Jesus Christ in us and therefore we are justified we are right with God because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why. Don't you ever think for one moment that you can do something for your salvation 
It is all the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the thing in order for us to be saved is to repent of our sins, to humble ourselves, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, and that righteousness will be imputed unto us. We will be forgiven, justified, and we will have eternal life. Amen. Romans chapter 4, verse number 5. But to him that worketh not, you see? To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So you don't have to do anything to undo your sin. We do not have to do anything to merit the forgiveness of God. Jesus Christ did everything for us. And if we will only believe in Him, not in our religion, not in any uh, human system in gaining salvation, but only believe on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will be saved because it will be counted for us as righteousness. It is not of works, it's not of the law. Look at Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. You see, no matter what you do, you cannot obey the law. Because once you disobey just one law, you disobeyed all of the law. All the law can do is to curse men. And once you disobey one law and you did not continue living in the law, then you will be under curse. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That is why it is of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once sinners have placed their faith in Christ, God declared us righteous. But I'm a sinner. No, God says you're already righteous. Because you already have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why believers have peace with God. Why? Because all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. That's why uh, Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're not justified. It is as if you did not commit sin ever. We are righteous in the sight of God. That's why once forgiven, we are no longer subject to the judgment of God. That's why Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. Amen? No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So why would you gamble with your, etern etern your eternity through your works and through your religion or through your own belief when the Lord Jesus Christ has provided a way of salvation, a way of forgiveness, a way of justification? So, the declaration of this work is called justification. So, what is this? Justification is an act of God's grace. That a guilty sinner places his, his or her faith in Christ and is acquitted by God. A wrongdoer is made right with God. You see, there is a, uh, uh, an illustration about uh, justification. Uh, this is uh, an illustration about uh, Rolls Royce. There was this rich man who bought a Rolls Royce and he brought that Rolls Royce to uh, an, an island uh, country or something like that, maybe uh, like Fiji or Guam, something like that. And then he used that Rolls Royce, but there was a problem. And a problem happened to his Rolls Royce. So he asked Rolls Royce about it and immediately they flew a, uh, a mechanic from the USA or wherever the Rolls Royce was made to that place and the mechanic fixed the problem of the Rolls Royce. And when this person went back to the place, 
He called Rolls Royce and said, how much do I owe you for, repa uh, for uh, repairing my Rolls Royce? They said, sir, there is no record that you owe us anything. He said, but somebody fixed my Rolls Royce. There is no record that any problem has happened to a Rolls Royce. That's the same thing with God. When we are justified, the devil may continue to condemn us. The devil may continue to point at our sin. But when God looked through the records, he will see the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will tell the devil, there is nothing wrong with him. Why? He was justified by my son's life. Amen? So that is justification. That is why we are so blessed. And what do we have to do with this blessing that God had given us, this grace that God had given us? We need to have the right attitude as a Christian, amen, towards the will of God. And then after that, uh, we will skip the other chains, but uh, we will go there later. The permanent chains comes after death or rapture. The permanent change is what we call glorification. When one day we will be in heaven and we are going to have a glorified body, like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's why, you know, some Christians are saying that, well, I do not have to diet, I do not have to reduce, I do not have to exercise. Because in heaven, there is a perfect body that's waiting for me. That's in heaven. But I guarantee you, if you are not going to... Uh, uh, live a, uh, a kind of life that will make your, your body here uh, you know, healthy, then you are going to live hell here on earth before experiencing heaven. Amen? Amen? So it will happen at our death or at the rapture. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 53. 15 to 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 53. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we cannot inherit the kingdom of God in this uh, kind of body. Neither that corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Means we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. There will be a change. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen? We are now living in a corruptible flesh, but we will be given a body that is incorruptible, a body that will never grow old, a body that will never experience sickness, a body that will, that will never have wrinkles anymore. Ladies, Amen? So there will be a lot of savings that will happen during the millennium. Because you do not have to beautify yourself. You will be in your perfect beauty. In your perfect condition. Because God will give us a body wherein when you look at the mirror, you will say, my, what a body. Amen? Perfect in every way. And that will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ comes or when we die, whichever will come first. Look at Philippians 3, 20 to 21. For our conversation, he says, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Amen? The body that... that uh, Peter, James, and John saw the Mount of Transfiguration. A body that shines. A body that, that can go through a closed door, through a wall. A body that can go to heaven and back to earth in no time at all. A body that is not limited by time and space. Like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So this is a future event. And this is what we call glorification. So if you are saved, you will be glorified. When you die or when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. So 
This is our hope. Amen? This is our blessed hope. But then there is what we call the progressive change. And this is what we call sanctification. This happened over time. It is a time between these two changes. It is a time where we live right now. We are now in what we call the process of sanctification. It begins when we are saved. And it will continue until we die. Or until we are raptured. So listen, it is the progressive growth of each, Christ, of each believer as they become more like Christ. So listen, the progressive case of being conformed into the image of Christ, of becoming more and more like Him, takes place through the rest of our lives. That is why the life of a Christian must be progressive. Meaning to say, we started as a babe. And then we grow until the time that we will become matured in the faith. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ will come or when we die, then we, that, that uh, process of sanctification will be complete into what we call glorification. So this involves God making us more set apart from our sins and more like Him. For the believer, there must be a constant and ever-increasing sense that though sin remains, remember this, that though sin remains, it is not in control. Yes, there are still sins in our lives. But it is not in control of our life. The Holy Spirit is the one who is in control of our life. You see, it is one thing to live uh, to, uh, for sin to live in the believer, but it is another thing for the believer to live in sin. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings about the sanctification in our lives. So it is a moving from the works of the flesh into the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Look at Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 24. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. When you say it's sin which are this adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning to say, this should not be our lives. It, it doesn't say that when you did that, you're already doomed to hell. No. You, it means to say that when you practice that, when you are living that kind of life, then you, you will not in, uh, uh, enter into the, or inherit the kingdom of God. So we are moving from, from that, past that, into uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. As we are being sanctified day by day, then these things are increasing in our lives. Li uh, lives, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. That is why there is a, a change that is also manifest. Meaning to say, uh, you, you're a gossip when you got saved. You will move away from that. You may still gossip, but it's not a, a negative gossip, but you proclaim the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a movement from the works of the flesh to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But Pastor, why is it that I'm still the same? Because you, you're not saved. Because the Holy Spirit is not in your heart. Nothing is working inside that will have an effect on the outside. But if the Holy Spirit is there and is working, it will produce these things. Verse number 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So there is a crucifixion. There is a death dying from the things of the world. 
the work of the flesh and living into the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is why once we become saved, then the Holy Spirit will start to work in our lives to bring about this change. And this process is actually simple. It means that the things that we do without even thinking about them before, when we do them now, then there is this great guilt. There is this great consternation as the Holy Spirit brings these things about to our attention. Why? Because the work of the Holy Spirit is convicting us of the sins that we are still committing. So that is why in Romans chapter 8, 29 to 30, this is what the Bible says. For whom he did for now, he also did predestinate to be conformed. So we are conforming. And we will conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. So how will these things come to pass? How will all of these things happen to us? Verse number 28. And in verse number 20 it says, And we know that all things work together for good. It is the Holy Spirit working in all things in our lives, including the sin that we commit, in order to work in our lives so that we will be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. God takes, takes everything that happens in our lives and uses them to make us more like Jesus Christ. But we are not robots. God has given us free will to choose to love and to serve Him. It is not something that God will force on us. We have a choice. That is a, why here, what the determining factor that these things will happen to us is our attitude. If we have a godly attitude, then this will happen to us. But if we have an ungodly attitude, then none of this will happen to us. Listen, attitude is our mental and emotional responses to the circumstances in life. Listen, often we cannot change our circumstances, but we can change our attitude about those circumstances. You see, if you have a bad attitude, then no matter what happens, you will look at it in a bad way or a bad manner. If you have a good attitude, though, no matter what happens, even though it may seem bad, you will look at the positive side of those things. So, why? Because our attitude, number one, is uh, our attitudes are chosen by us. We can choose to look at any situation positively or negatively. There are people who are just negative. No matter what you do, they will always find a negative thing on the things that are happening. And there are people who are just positive. And no matter what happened, they will find a good thing about those things. Like, for example, this illustration, there were two farmers. One was a pessimist and the other an optimist. When the sun shines, the optimist will say, wonderful sunshine. And then the pessimist will say, yes, but it might scorch the crop and they may die. And then when it's raining, we say, fine rain. But the pessimists will say, yeah, but it might produce flood. And it will kill all of our crops. So, in everything that is happening, you will always find a bad thing or a bad result regarding those things. Then one day, this uh, pessimist uh, a farmer bought a bird dog, hunting dog. And then he told the, his uh, pessimist uh, friend that I have a hunting dog the best that you can find here in our, in our county. And he said that, uh, oh, is that the uh, ugly looking dog behind your house? You see, always negative. And then the, the optimist uh, farmer said, okay, can we go hunting tomorrow? To which the pessimist farmer agreed to go with him. So they went duck hunting and actually shot several ducks. And then after that, the uh, pessimist uh, farmer uh, commanded the uh, dog, the bird dog, to get the uh, ducks that they shot. 
And then, this pessimist dog, but it uh, actually landed on a pond. And this dog went to the pond and walked on top of the water. That's why the best that you can ever find. And he was able to retrieve all the ducks by walking on the water. And then when uh, the dog brought all the ducks to them, the optimist farmer said, you see what my dog did? And then the pessimist farmer said, your dog cannot swim. <laughs> he will always find something wrong. There are just people who are confirmed pessimists. I remember when I was watching Gulliver's Travel, there was this one uh, person there who will always say, we'll never make it. Nothing good will happen. We'll never make it. Every time he will say negative things. And ladies and gentlemen, if you are going to be like that, if that is your response in a negative way, then you are not going to experience the blessings of God in your lives. Amen? But other people can look at the same circumstances and choose a positive outlook. And the Apostle Paul is one good example of this. When he showed a good a positive attitude. He was in prison, awaiting to be beheaded, but he wrote in that prison to rejoice in the Lord always and again. I said rejoice. Amen? Some people will whine. Some people will complain. Some people will blame God. But the Apostle Paul, even though about to die, he said, I am rejoicing with my Lord. Not only that, he actually says that I have learned in whatsoever state I am, thy will to be content. He may be in prison, he's contented. He may not have any food, he's contented. He may be floating uh, on water, he is content. No matter what's happening to him, people are trying to kill him. People are trying to put him in prison. People are trying to do anything that is bad against the apostle Paul. But in spite of all these things, he says, none of these things move me. Why? He has a godly, positive attitude given to him by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Every one of us makes a choice when it comes to our attitude. You either be negative or positive. I, I'm, not, I'm not teaching uh, the power of positive thinking. But I am teaching faith that all things work together for good. We may not understand it. But one thing we know, God is working for our good. Like what the song says, I don't know what may happen tomorrow, but it says, I know who holds tomorrow. And I know he holds my hand. You see, there are so many you know, examples that we can share in order to prove that a positive outlook will do, will do us well in our Christian life. That's why if we are not going to have or we're not going to choose a right and positive attitude, then we are going to live a miserable Christian life. You see, miserable Christian life. Christian life should not be miserable. Amen? It should be victorious. It should be something that will uh, help us glorify and honor God in our lives. So our attitude is because of our choices. Not only that, but also our attitudes are influenced by input. That's why we need to make a choice because of the inputs that, are, uh, that we are exposed to every day. Uh, it is influenced by what we read, by what we see, by who we listen to, and what we think about. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4.8, he says that whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, he says, Good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Why? Because in our mind, it is garbage in, garbage out. Hindi mo isipin mo puro ka bastusan, magiging bastus ka. 
Isipin mo puro katatakutan. Hindi ka makaihi sa gabi. Matatakot ka. Isipin mo puro negative things, fatalistic things, and you will become, become uh, fatalistic in your view in life. Because whatever comes in will come out. That is why we need to be careful about what we allow to come into our uh, heart and to our mind. But not only that, but our attitude is not only influenced by what we read, what we see, uh, hear, and think about, but it is also influenced by our friends. That is why it is very important for a Christian to keep company with Christians who love the Lord. Why? Because if you are not going to do this, and you will go with corrupt people, then you will also be corrupted. And instead of living the Christian life that will glorify God, you will live a life that is away from the will of God. You see, in Proverbs 13.20 it says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Just walking with the wise will make you wise. You know, sometimes even if you are stupid, when you walk with the wise, it seems that you are wise. Some people will wear eyeglass even if there is no problem with their eyes. So that they will look like wise. Wise talaga, amen? <laughs> he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So we all know that we are judged by those people we hang out with. Because uh, birds of the same feather flock together. Don't tell me that, oh, I love the Lord. And you keep company with drunkards. You don't love the Lord. You love yourself. You want to enjoy the best of both worlds, which is impossible. Because those words are contrary an exact opposite of each other. David also wants us to avoid relationship with ungodly, or the author of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Pare, I have a problem. What will I do? Alika pare, inum tayo. And we will figure out what you can do. Do not ask for their counsel. You ask for the counsel of God. You ask for the counsel of godly people, those people who loves God. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. In the New Testament, it was reiterated by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? Something in common. What do we have that is in common with the unrighteous people? So what? What fellowship at righteousness with unrighteousness? They're opposite. They're against each other. If you're unrighteous, you're not righteous. If you're righteous, you're not unrighteous. So you cannot be an unrighteous righteous. That's just opposite. It cannot be. It cannot happen. And what communion hath light with darkness? Don't you know that you cannot mix light and darkness? Because Light is the absence of darkness, and darkness is the absence of light. You cannot say that, oh, look at that light, there is darkness. No. If there is light, there is no darkness. If, it is, if there is darkness, there is no light. And what concord, like, like a musical term, harmony, hath Christ with Belial. They are just opposite. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So that's why if we want to have a right godly attitude, we must choose our friends. Amen? Don't even try. But you know, Pastor, my friends and believing friends are even better than wow. How can they be better when they're going to hell? Answer that question. How can they be better when they are children of the devil? 
And the believers are the uh, children of God. They may seem to be better, but they're on a slippery road. On a slippery slope. There is just no comparison. But some Christians are just have a bad testimony. So don't hang out with them, pray for them, help them. But hang out with Christians that love the Lord. Who is showing a good testimony. Who is serving God. Studying the word of God. Faithfully attending church. And doing the things that will glorify God. Hang out with them. And they will influence you by the grace of God. To become a godly Christian. Or to live a life that is according to the will of God. Why are these things important? Because our attitudes affect our relationships. You, we cannot deny that. All of us are involved in relationships. And those relationships must improve over and over again. We have relationship with our spouse, with our friends, with our church mate. Relationship with our uh, employer, employee, etc., etc. And with our church members, the Bible teaches that a wrong attitude is the major source of relationship conflicts. If you're wrong attitude, you will have conflict after conflict after conflict. Look at James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. From whence comes wars and fighting among you? Sa magaling yung pag-aaway sa inyo. Sabi ni James. Come they not hence even of your last that war in your members. Di ba yung, 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 kasi kagustuhan mo, kalooban mo. Ye last and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Listen. In other words, contentions personally, personality clashes and discord in the church come from us having self-centered attitudes and pride. If there are two persons who are determined to insist their way, then there is going to be conflict, whether you like it or not. If you said, I want white, and you're determined, and the other says, I want black, and is determined, there is going to be a conflict until someone gives in. It will never happen. That's why, if there is a leader, and you want to become the leader, then there is going to be conflict. There, will, there is going to be a, a positioning in the church and it will hurt the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most problems come from a lust for power and control. You see, if you're an understudy, just be humble and be faithful because your time will come. You see, for example, we have young people here. I'm already old. Amen. Brother Rison also is old. Many of us are old. We are going to fade from the scene. And then the young people will take over later on. So their time will come. So wait for the timing of God. Do not insist your own way. You see, when I was a, a, a not, not really a new Christian, but I was a, still under the uh, authority and tutelage of my pastor in the Philippines, we have, there are things that we do not agree. There are really things that we do not agree. My wife knows this. But, as long as I am under him and in that church, I do not insist my own way. I can talk to him and explain myself. But if, this, if his decision is contrary to what I believe or what I want, I will just obey him. Because I need to uh, be under the rulership of the leader of the church. We do not agree when it comes to offering. But I do not have to insist my way. I am not the pastor of the church. But then I became a pastor and when I was the pastor, then that's the time that I taught the church what I, I, I think what the Bible is actually think, uh, teaching. That is not in agreement with him. And when that time happens, he respected me because I am now a leader of a local church. So let us, let us give way, amen? And let us not insist on our own way. You see, the, the solution to all of these problems or conflict, 
We can find that in Philippians 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. This is the solution. Philippians 2, 3 to 7. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Instead of competing, trying to uh, uh, outdo other people, think of them as higher than you, better than you. Let not every man, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, listen, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Jesus himself, God himself, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. That's humility. Amen? That's meekness. And was made in the likeness of of men. Do you know why he was able to obey God the Father even at the death of the cross of Calvary? It's because of his humble mind. If we are going to be humble, listen, there is always competition up there, but there is no competition down here. Kasi pag nagpataas ang kayo, walang limit eh. Pero pag nagpababa ang kayo, pag sumagad na hanggang doon na lang. Pare-pareho na kayo. Wala nang hihigit pa. At isa pa yung mababantao, yapak-yapakan mo man, hindi apektado. Hindi na siya bababa pa. Amen? That is why we need to have this attitude. So, what will this, uh, how will this attitude come to us? Of course, as I have said, because of the help of the Holy Spirit, the help of God, and our attitude are the cause and result of right behavior. You see, number one, it says in Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So you must have that uh, humble mind so that you will become humble. But also, right action also produces right attitude. So not only right thinking, but we must have right action because if we will do uh, act righteously, then we, it will produce a right attitude in us. Do you remember the story between Cain and Abel? The, the, the opening of Abel was accepted. The opening of Cain was not accepted. And what happened to Cain? He became despondent. He was very sad. So what was the solution given to him by God? Let us look at Genesis 4, 4 to 7. This is what God told uh, Cain. And Abel, he also brought of the first ring of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no res not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? Look at the advice. If thou doest well, do well, do what is right. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So God is telling Cain, if you did what is right, then you're going to be accepted. You will feel good. You will have the right attitude when we do what is right. You see, we are living in a feeling-oriented society. If it feels good, do it. If it does not feel good, then don't do it. A husband or wife seeks a divorce because they say there is no more feeling anymore. Or people will, keep, will quit their jobs saying they don't feel fulfilled anymore. Or Christians will quit going to church because they don't feel the spirit anymore in the services. Yet God's word to Cain is very simple. This is the key. Right feelings is the result of right action. Do what is right and you will feel right. Amen? Amen. Do what is righteous and you are going to have a good attitude in life. So that's the key. Let us think right 
rightly. Let us do rightly. And we will, it will result in a right life. Amen? You agree, amen? amen? We must. And then lastly, our attitude will determine our eternity. You see, we define what is attitude. It is our mental or emotional response to the circumstances of life. While we have many different experiences, there is one experience that is common to all people, and that is the experience of sin. All of us committed sin, amen? So what is your attitude towards sin? What is your attitude towards how God looked at sin? What is sin? Sin is the breaking of the law. First John 3, 4, whosoever committed sin, transgressed also the law. What is sin? All unrighteousness is sin. According to 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. What is sin? It is failing to do what we know what we should do. For 17 of James, therefore to him that know where to do good and do with it not to him, it is sin. What, so ever is not of faith, it is sin. So these are the biblical definition of sin. So there are many different kinds of sin. Not only the breaking the Ten Commandments, but there are so many different kinds of sin. But the question is, what is your attitude toward that failure in your life? How do you see sin in your life? You see, some people have the attitude of, you know, they said that, I don't care. They have the attitude of unbelief. Oh, there is no God, therefore there is no sin. Some of the attitude of indifference, so what? If I committed sin. Some of the attitude of pride. I may not be perfect, but I am better than most people. But there is only one attitude that is acceptable. And that is to own your sin, repent of your sin, open your heart, and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you do that, it will determine your eternal destiny. Your attitude towards sin will determine if you are going to spend your eternity in hell or if you are going to spend your eternity in heaven. And for a Christian, our attitude toward the sins that are still happening in our lives will determine if we are going to live a victorious Christian life or a defeated or mediocre Christian life. Because the Bible is very clear. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So today as I close, listen to me very carefully. If you are not yet saved, if you are not yet 100% sure that when you die, you will go to heaven, it only means that you will go to hell when you die. But there is an attitude that you can have today towards that sin. And that is to repent of that sin, to hate that sin, agree with God regarding that sin. Open your heart and receive Jesus as your Savior. And God will forgive you. He will justify you. You will be forgiven and you will have the gift of eternal life. And to Christians, what are we doing with our Christian life? There are still sins, mistakes, errors in our lives. What are we going to do about it? Why don't we surrender it to God? Repent of those sins and ask God to forgive us that we may be a force in the ministry. Because when God forgives us, he will cleanse us. And if we are clean, then we will be fit for the master's use. And if God will use us, then we can accomplish so much, not because of us, but because of the Holy Spirit that is in our hearts. Shall we stand there, please? Well, every head's our